He is so good. So absolutely awesome. And I'm so excited to be standing up here. It's scary as anything as you can possibly imagine. <laughs> but when I know one of those promises, that he's right here. He's right here. And as I walked up the aisle, he took that fear away. Because he's awesome. He's absolutely awesome. A couple weeks ago, Pastor Ken realized that he and Pastor Brian were both scheduled to go to the men's retreat. And uh, he asked me to preach or to talk, however you want to call it. <sighs> He's so good. <laughs> so I thought about it for a day, and then I emailed him back, and I said, sure, I'll do that. <laughs> Not realizing the email that I was going to get next was, this is what I want you to do. I want you to preach on it. Healing, healing, anything that we do, everything flows through Jesus' love. Everything, absolutely everything. If it doesn't, it's not from Him. And it's useless. It's useless. Everything comes from Jesus' love. So this is me reading it backwards. If you love me, but you also have to understand this. It's easy to say, I love Jesus, especially because we're in here. I love Jesus. How many times a day do we say that? I love Jesus. It's so easy. But how easy is it? How easy is it to understand that he loves you? Come on. 
He loves you. He loves each and every individual person. He loves your heart. He loves you. It's so hard to get that. So hard to get that. If it's so hard to get that, how do we get that? You start doing it. You start keeping his commandments. You start to understand that you're supposed to love him. And he shows you more and more. And the more he shows you, hold on, the more he shows you, the more you believe. And the more you believe, and the more you understand that he loves you, and you can love him back, the more you want to keep his commandments, the more you want to do it. And guess what? Guess what's really cool about that? All those things in between and greater things than you will do, if you figure that out and then you get more belief and then you understand, start to understand and then you'll start to do all those cool things in between. You'll start to heal because you're starting to listen to him. And then he, and we're gonna, well, I'm going to share a couple examples. You start to listen to him and you start to obey him. So when he tells you, guess what? That person in the fifth row back there, third one in, they need, they need healing over, they have a wicked bad migraine. They need healing. When you start to listen to him, when you do these things, all of a sudden he tells you right there, go do it. Don't wait, do it now. Right now. Don't wait around. If you wait around, you're gonna get the huma your humanity involved. And then it gets all messed up and you get jumbled. So we're going to do that today, at the end. That's what we're going to do. So as I'm talking, if the spirit starts pounding your heart, that's pretty cool. <laughs> if he starts pounding your heart, at the end, we're going to do what we normally do in church. We're going to play music, but you're going to come forward and expect and expect. So what I want to do right this second is everybody in this room, close your eyes. Everyone. Don't, don't open your eyes. Everybody close your eyes. Don't miss it. And I'm going to pray. Whew. Dear Jesus, I, first off, I thank you for this moment. Man, had you been working out this for a long, long time, and I've just been in the way. But Holy Spirit, I invite you right now, right this second, to be in this room. Because if we do this without you here, it means nothing. Absolutely nothing. You're the only one in here that can free every heart. You're the only one in here that can heal. You're the only one that does anything. And we just need to be willing to go and follow and love you and trust you and believe and understand that you love us. In Jesus' name, I thank you that you will do and we will listen. Amen. So for a while now, this verse, this whole verse, has messed me up. It says, greater works than these shall I do if I believe, right? So if I'm not doing greater works, do I believe? Well, what am I doing? What am I doing? If I can't go and through the power of the Holy Spirit make things happen, what am I doing? He's not responding to me for some reason, right? So through a lot of prayer and a lot of groaning and moaning and complaining, <laughs> he finally says, I just want you to know that I love you. And I just want you to do what I ask you to do. And if you don't, it's just not going to happen. But if you do, if you do, Greater works will happen. So I started asking him, what's the problem? What's going on? And I had to travel a long way, all the way down to beautiful West Palm Beach, Florida, to start to understand even more. And what I understood was this. And I'm going to carry this around. I hope you don't mind. Don't let it distract you. What he showed me was, this is what I'm doing. I'm sitting right here. And I'm praying. And I'm reading. 
and I'm singing, and I'm trying to love him. If I'm sitting right here, uh-oh, if I'm sitting right here, ah, oh, nice and comfortable. Can somebody get me a snack and a water, please? Just nice and comfortable, just sitting here, waiting, 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 waiting. Oh, you know, the first couple months is cool, right? It's cool, but all of a sudden my head starts to bob, I start to fall asleep. Because what's happening is I'm letting everybody else around me be my Christian. And I'm letting everything, I'm letting Tony sing fantastic worship songs. And I'm listening to Pastor Ken preach great sermons. So I'm asking, so I started asking myself, what, 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 what in the world can I do to change this, right? I said, is this how... Is this how my Christian destiny is going to be? Am I going to just sit there? Am I just going to sing and maybe get a little, a little tingle, tingle in the back of my neck? We all know when the Holy Spirit shows up. I don't want just a tingle. I don't want just a tingle anymore. I don't want to just sit. I want him to do his thing. Just coming to church and just coming here on a Sunday. That ain't going to cut it. That ain't going to cut it. He wants us to do way more. Way more than just sit in that seat. Because when we realize those things, <laughs> when we realize how much more he has, we're not afraid was suddenly not afraid of, I can't share my faith. It's so hard to share my faith. When we sit in a restaurant and the food's in front of us, we know as Christians what we're supposed to do. We're still supposed to pray and thank him for the food because that's just what we do. We need to change the prayer from looking around going, oh, dear Jesus, please bless this food. And help, so I hope nobody's watching me. We need to pray like this and let people see us pray. And let people understand that there's more to life than food. And there's more. We need to get them curious in the restaurant, right in the restaurant. It happens in a restaurant. It happens in Walmart. It happens in Dunkin' Donuts. It happens wherever you go. Because guess what? Where you go, <laughs> he goes. Period. That's just how it is. So church is a great place to start. It's a fantastic place to start, right? It's a comfortable place to start. People that don't have Jesus in their heart. People that need to like, like when you first become a Christian, you want to grow and you want to, you want to get it on, right? I remember when I first became a Christian, I wanted to save the universe in that day. <laughs> But then, like I said, I just sat. I just sat. And then slowly lifted my, dropped my head back and fell asleep and went into like this churchy coma. Right? For a long time. Until now. So watch out. <laughs> but like I said, church is a good place to start, right? Help me, Lord, stay on track. Church is a good place to start. But what are we supposed to do? And here it is. Everything you need is in the Bible. Isn't that convenient? Yeah. So convenient. <laughs> Matthew 28, 16 through 20. And we in church have named it the Great Commission. But the 11 disciples proceeded to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had designated. When they saw him, they worshipped him. Man, but guess what? Some were still doubtful. How crazy is that? You're with Jesus. You're seeing him split water and, and walk on the water and wipe out leprosy and heal the blind, but you still, duh, you still don't get it. I just needed to throw something funny in there. <clears throat> and Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go! Go, 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 go. There's the word, go. Don't sit. Don't sit. Sit's sit good on Sunday, but go. 
There's a Monday through a Saturday still. We can't forget that. Therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then we get to this part. Where are we on the screen so you can see it? Is teaching on the screen? Oh, it is. Sorry. Okay. This is one of the biggest things, and I just got this yesterday. This is one of the biggest things that the church is missing. Boom. The church is missing something? They are. And I experienced that when I was a kid, and that's why I just sat and fell asleep. Because after we talk to them, after they repent, after they get baptized, after we baptize them in the Holy Spirit, we're supposed to take them by the shoulders. And we're supposed to teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. That's why so many of us, that's why so many of us are just sitting here. Just sitting here. Because we don't know. We don't know. Many are. Many do. But that's why so many of us are just sitting here. Because we need a Moses if we're Joshua. We need an Elijah if we're Elisha. We need that. We need to come up next to someone. And we need to go to the mall with them. Watch. This is how it's done. This is how you do it. We need to go to Friday night prayer. And listen to Kyle go, this is how you do it. Because I know this is how I do it. Because he told me how to do it. He showed me how to do it. We need to teach. We need to have a discipleship program in here. Everyone in here, every single person, healing is for everyone. Period. Across the board. He doesn't say, oh, it's only for the people that stand up here. Or it's only for the people who are going to pray today. Or it's only for the people that, oh, they just have some kind of magical holiness. No. He says if you're a disciple, you go. And we're going to get to that. You heal. You heal the sick. He doesn't say maybe you heal the sick. He says you go and you pray and you do it. Period. We've got to start teaching. But first, we've got to start going. We've got to start going. Because guess what? If I stayed right there, I wouldn't be standing right here. If I stayed right there, I wouldn't understand anything. I understand nothing, but I wouldn't understand anything. We got to go to figure him out. God made people to figure things out. Why do you think we know? And I was just telling Bob, why do you think we know that a dolphin's nose has like five million senses? Because we wanted to know. Why did we want to know? Because God put it in here. He put it in here. Not to find out about some dolphin's nose. But he put it in here so we have the desire to go find out. So that we have the desire to go and hunt him down. Hunt down God. How do I do this, God? You told me that I can heal. You told me that I can do all these things in your name. If we don't go, we don't even find out that much. But I can tell you by going, once you find out this much, you want to know that much. And you'll go again. And then you want to know this much. And then you go again. You just keep going. But we got to go. We got to go. I knew I was going to miss my place. <laughs> oh, there it is. There it is. Sorry. And this is why we have to go. Here comes an earthly thing. Research on how people learn has revealed the following. Stay with me here. People remember 10% of what they read, 20% of what they hear, 30% of what they see, 50% of what they hear and see, 70% of what they say, but 90% of what they do. That's why he wants us to be doers of the word and not just hearers of the word. Because he knows when you do, you want that much, that much, that much. You want everything. 
because that's what he wants. When I got back from West Palm Beach, and I went to a conference down there about some things, and it shed a lot of light. If anybody has any questions on that, I'd, be free, I'd, I'd, I'd feel free not to tell you anything. But, uh, but no, for real, if you want to know, I'll tell you everything. But I came back and I was wondering, like, God, how does this healing work in the land of the frozen chosen? Everyone in this place knows what that statement means. How does it work? And he showed me. He said, just like this, take your kids. Oh, man. Take your kids and go to the mall, the Manchester Mall, and start praying for people and just watch what I do. So to make a long story short, we prayed for a bunch of people, which is nasty unto itself. It's just so crazy. You walk in there and you see a guy with a cane, you're like, oh my God, am I supposed to pray for him? I don't know. You, but you're trying to figure it all out, right? I don't know when I'm walking in there. And the pressure's on. Let's face it, the pressure's on. My kids are with me. I want them to learn. I want them to have it in them. I want them not to leave the church when they're 15, 16, and 17 because they're bored. I want them to rock and roll all the time. All the time. It's my responsibility to train up my child in the way that they should go so that they not, do not depart from it. But how do I do that? I train them up in the way they should go and I make sure I go there myself. I show them how to do it. I show them how to do it. Period. That's how it works. That's exactly how it works. So we go to the mall. We walk around. Some people told me to get lost. Some nasty stuff. Prayer doesn't work. Get out of here. And you could see it on his face. He'd been prayed for before. It didn't work. Isn't that funny how we do that? Even at church. Even now, like when you come up a little bit later, you won't hear anybody preach on healing and say, guess what? If it doesn't happen to work, that's like the kiss of death. We just have to believe that it will work, right? And if it doesn't, don't hold God guilty for that. Don't hold him over the coals and say, God, it didn't work. I'm too broken. You can't fix me. You didn't want to fix me today. Gee, I must have this sickness or this illness because you're trying to teach me something. God can teach you something without any sickness, sir and those. He doesn't need cancer. He doesn't need a broken leg. He doesn't need that stuff to teach you nothing. He just does it because he's God. So in the last, Manchester Mall, I don't know if you're familiar, but it's like a big square, and you just lap it. You just lap it, right? You just keep going around, and me and the kids are there, and guess who we ran into? Boom, Kyle Troll. <laughs> what a surprise. Oh, my goodness, Kyle, how'd you get here? You want to come around with us? Yeah, definitely, sure. I got nothing to do. Let's go. So we make a couple laps and pray for a couple people. And then all of a sudden, we take a turn, and I'm walking down the aisle, and the mall also has those kiosks in the middle and stuff, and I'm walking down the aisle, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, I don't know where it comes from. I do know where it comes from. But I'm like, that guy, that guy, that guy. And I start, I start pointing at him, that guy right there. And the guy goes, oh, my God, are you going to kill me? <laughs> I said, no, that guy. And I'm telling Kyle, because you know what? When you have other people there with you, who are like-minded and want to do the same thing, who want to pray for people and heal people. It gives you confidence. They got you back. They got your back. My son, my daughter, Kyle, they had my back. So that when I heard from Jesus, I could go, that guy. And I approached that guy. And I said, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. Is this, is this still going? I said, don't worry. I just have to ask you a question. And it might sound really weird. But do you have pain in your body? Is there any pain at all in your body? Immediately, he said, yeah, man, my hips. He said, I'm a, I'm a Marine, and I'm on medical discharge because I wrecked my hips. And I said, really? Well, let me tell you why I asked you that question. Because I'm a Christian, and my God, in my Bible, says if I put my hand on your shoulder and I pray in Jesus' name, that your pain will be gone. Boom. It's going to be gone. Do you want me to do that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Definitely, right now. Do it right now. Do it right now. In the name of Jesus, it's 
all it takes. In the name of Jesus, I pray that the pain be gone in these hips. I didn't shut my eyes. Be gone in these hips right now in the name of Jesus. So Patrick, tell me, how did that, how did that work? How do you test that? All I have to do is walk. I said, then what are you waiting for? He starts walking, takes the first couple steps like, and then he's like, wait a second. He turns around. How did you do that? I said, I didn't. That's what's so cool about it. I can't do that. Jesus did that. And in the course of our conversation, he told me he was from Vermont, two to two and a half hours away from where we're standing. He told me that when he was on a Marine base, I don't know when, he, we didn't get into the details of that, him and some of his buddies went to a church, and he knew there was, this is exactly what he said, I knew there was something different about the church. I knew it, right? So then I said to him, is there anything still there? He goes, yeah, it still hurts a little bit. I said, on a scale of one to 10, where did you start? He said, it was about an eight. So okay, an eight, that's usually where it starts. So then I said, uh, where is it now? He said, about a five. So then he's standing there, and I step back. This is what a disciple does. Teaches, teaches them what I, command, what I commanded. You know what I'm saying? Teach you what I'm commanding. I step back. <laughs> this is Paige. She's 14. This is my daughter. She's going to do the same thing that I just did. And I pushed her over there. <laughs> and, I, and I said, she's going to do the same thing. Do you mind if she does that? This guy almost collapsed. Are you crazy? You think I mind if she does that? Right? Of course he doesn't mind. He could care less if I, if I cut his legs off. He could care less because the Holy Spirit's moving. And he felt it. You can't deny it. It cannot be denied. When he's working, it can't be denied. In the name of Jesus. Oh, she said, in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Pain be gone. Boop. How's it feel, man? Now he's like this. Yeah! He turns around. Excuse my French. How the hell did you just do that? <laughs> I didn't do it. But then all of a sudden, I had this thing come in my head. And that's the Holy Spirit. When, when you're willing to listen, he'll tell you. I had this thing come in my head. And I looked him straight in the eye. The thing about a Marine... They're, they're strong. You have to honor them. They need to be honored. The thing about anyone in the military, they need to be honored. Yeah. And that's why I start crying. <laughs> There's something more with them. There's something more. And I saw it in his eyes. I grabbed him by the shoulders. I looked him right in the eye. I said, what are the chances that you come to the mall on a busy Saturday at the exact time, two and a half hours from your house, and then you tell me that you went to a, a, a marine base um, church and there was something different. What are the odds? I said, there are no odds. None. That doesn't happen without the Holy Spirit. It doesn't happen without him. And I said, he's after you. Right in the eye. And he looked me right in the eye. He was deathly serious. He, and I said, he's after you and you need to pay attention. He wants to do things with you that you can't even begin to imagine. And he looked back at me and he said, thank you. And then he left. And now it's up to the Holy Spirit. Go. Go. I'm totally losing track of time, so I have no idea when I'm, when I'm supposed to be done. I have... <laughs> but an interesting question about going <laughs> is the opposite one. What happens if I don't go? What happens if I don't go? I never see Patrick. Never. And I never learn how Jesus wants me to do things. And I just sit and do nothing. Absolutely nothing. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a German theologian in the time of Hitler. Hitler killed him because Hitler's, Hitler's 
No, we don't have to talk about him. Said that silence in the face of evil, oh, Jesus, Holy Spirit, is in itself evil. God will not hold us guiltless. He won't hold us guiltless for just sitting here. Not to speak is to speak. And not to act is to act. If we just sit, then we're acting. We're acting opposite of what Jesus wants us to. There's always an action in our action and in our non-action. Always. So perhaps by not speaking or not acting, we're actually not speaking and not acting against God, yes. against Him. Yes. Am I saying you've got to be at the mall every 50 seconds? No, no, no. Even Jesus didn't do it all the time. He took breaks and He went up on top of the mountain to speak to His Father. And as we said in the first verse, that's where it starts, when you understand that you need to do that. You've got to do that. If you're not doing that, Oh my goodness, do it. By not opposing the things that are opposed to Jesus, are we indirectly agreeing with the things opposed to Jesus? Yeah. I think so. There's always an action. Always, always. Even right this second, there's always an action. Yeah. We're always acting. The physical things that we do, sorry for reading this, but I just got this one. The physical things that we do, or that we don't do, always have a spiritual impact on who we're going to become. Always. Always. When I was sitting in that seat, one of my favorite songs has this line in it. And would my comfort prefer me to be numb? and avoid the impending birth of who I'm to become? Does my comfort stop me from meeting up with Patrick? Does my comfort, does Kyle's comfort stop him from praying for his wife's neck? Does it happen with Mark? My comfort, no, I'm not gonna pray for him. I'm good. This makes me comfy. I'm good. We've gotta go. We gotta go. <laughs> Okay, we gotta go. Huh. Okay, this is a long one. This is how we go. This is how we instruct us to go, right here. Here it is. Here it is in a nutshell. Those of us who don't really know how to go, here it is. There's so many misconceptions about how we need to go, but he's about to clear that up. Luke 10, Luke 10 1 through 11. Now after the Lord appointed 70 other, 70 other disciples and sent them in pairs, I'm just going to read it first. I'm not going to worry about clicking. Sent them in pairs ahead of him to every city and place where he himself was going to come. And he was saying to them, the harvest is plentiful. How many times have we heard that? Everybody out there, the Holy Spirit goes before us. Whether we want to actually think that or not, he goes before us. The Holy Spirit lined up the meeting with Patrick years ago. He was fixing me, fixing my family, and he was also fixing Patrick for that one Saturday afternoon when Patrick was two and a half hours away from his house on a busy Sunday, uh, Saturday afternoon in the mall. He's preparing it. He's making people ready for you. And you're not going to know that unless you go. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. Go. Behold, I send you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. You want to know why he sends you out as lambs in the midst of wolves? Because he's with you. He can, he, you can be anything. You could be a frog. And as long as he's with you, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Carry no money, no money belt, no bag, no shoes. You don't need nothing. You just need him. And greet no one on the way. <laughs> Whatever house you enter, first say, peace be to this house. This is the most important part. If a man of peace 
is there. Your peace will rest upon him. And then I'm not going to read the rest. The rest basically says if he's not a man of peace, you wipe your feet and you move on. How many times in Christianity do we stand there and we debate with the person that they need Jesus? We actually almost get into a fight. If you're witnessing to someone and they don't want it, the Holy Spirit's in control of you, whether you know it or not. I gotta go. Just before we saw Patrick was the dude that looked in my eye and he said, prayer doesn't work. Doesn't work. Just before. Prayer doesn't work. If I stood there or stood there and debated with him, I would have missed Patrick. Would have missed him. By a mile. Would have missed him. But because I went like this, okay, that's what you believe. That's cool. That's fine. I hope you don't die because if you do, you're bumming. <laughs> but the Holy Spirit's going to take care of you right now because he's in control of everything anyways. And if I stay here, nothing's going to happen. So whoop, whoop, whoop. I'm going to find Patrick. That's where I'm going. If a man of peace, if the Holy Spirit has moved his heart, and he already was, the Marine base, he was after him. He was already after him. So guess what? Because I wipe my feet over here, man, I get to see something go down over here. I get to see the Spirit move over here. Awesome. It was awesome. So you look for a person of peace. That's what you do. And then eventually you get through that one. Wow, that was a long one. Okay. This is an example in the Bible about a person of peace. Very humble man. Very humble, very honorable, like a Marine. <laughs> yeah. His name's Bartimaeus. He's a blind dude, and he's a beggar. Back then, here's normal people. Here's less normal people. Here's beggars. Right there. Right there. When people walk by them, they're like, eh. And he was blind, so he wasn't right here. He was like, he was almost touching the floor. He was so low. But listen to his heart in here. Listen to his heart. He was ready. He was warmed up. He was primed. Probably even more than that. Then they came to Jericho, Jesus and his disciples, right? And as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples in a large crowd, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the road. That's why I can't stand technology. So sitting by the road, when he heard that it was Jesus the Nazarene, he began to cry out. He didn't begin to yell, Jesus, do this for me. Do that for me. He didn't demand. He was coming to Jesus humbly because he knew that Jesus was the only one that could deliver for him. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He didn't just say Jesus, he said Jesus son of David. That tells me that he completely understood who he was talking to. He took the time in his normal life to pay attention, to learn who Jesus was. Learn it, to learn it. Huh. And many, many in the crowd, oh, did I, did I want to, uh, many, oh, mer, many sternly telling him to be quiet. Bartimaeus, shut up. You're blind. You're a beggar. Jesus doesn't give a crap about you. He doesn't care about you. Your blind is way too much for him to handle. Forget it. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if he hates you. Why do you keep doing this? But he kept crying out all the more. Son of David, have mercy on me. You know what's interesting about the crowd? Man, Bartimaeus wasn't the only blind person there. Everyone that said that to him were completely blind. They could see, but they couldn't see with this. 
Chances are some of them were hurt. Chances are some other ones were blind. Chances are they needed Jesus just as much as he did. But because of their, because of their, uh, their physical stuff, their things that they need, they let those get in the way. They missed it. Jesus walked by them. He walked by all of them. But then he heard Jesus, son of David. Son of David. Please, please touch me. <laughs> Jesus said, that man, just like that man, him, that guy, that guy, he wants it. He's ready. He wants it. Same thing. Awesome. He threw aside his cloak. He threw aside everything. Everything. Because he knew how important it was. He knew Jesus. He threw aside everything. All that he had. A cloak to a beggar back then was everything. Everything. Sorry. And he even said, Rabbi, I want to regain my sight. When Jesus asked him, that's an interesting thing as well. When Jesus asked him, what would you have me do for you? I don't know about you, but the last person I saw someone who was blind. All you have to do, like this guy was blind from, from birth. All you need to do is look at their eyes. Their eyes, they're not, they're not like normal eyes. You can tell that's the problem. So why would Jesus ask him, what would you have me do? Because he wanted to hear him say it. He wanted to hear his belief that if I just ask you to heal my eyes, I know you can do it. <laughs> He's so cool. And his respect is when he called him Rabbani. Means, in Hebrew, it means master. You are my master. Heal me, please, because no one else can. And I know you and I love you. And I'm willing to just stand here and show you. Hmm. And as, as Terry said in the, in, the, in the announcements, sometimes it takes more than once. One of the misconceptions in church is when, is when people come up to be healed, oh, be healed, right? Uh, that whoever's up here praying for you has some kind of special power, right? Or has some kind of, they're the only one that can do it. Kyle, I think, is the only one in the church that can actually do it, right? So, so when you come up here, know that there is no special power in any one person. It's only by the Holy Spirit. That's it. So when you come up later, right, when we come up later, come up like, come up like Bartimaeus. Leave everything in your seat, because that's where it belongs. It belongs in your seat. It's exactly where it belongs. Come up like him, expecting him to do it. And he will. He just will. That's his promise. And like I said, if he, for some reason he doesn't, it's his reasoning. It's not ours. It's totally up to him. So if he wants to do it, he's going to do it. But if he doesn't, it won't. What does that mean? That means go home. That means ask him. That means you take up your cross and you follow him. He says, I've, I've asked you to take up your own cross because I was already hanging on it. It's up to you to take it up. It's up to you to take ownership. It's up to you to take responsibility for who you want to be as a disciple. It's up to you. It's not up to Pastor Ken. It's not up to, yeah, let's sing a song. It's up to you. Totally up to you. Oh. So in Mark, in Mark 8, 22 through 26, it happens to be another blind man. Jesus is going to heal. And they came to Bethesda, and they brought a blind man to Jesus, imploring him, which means begging him, please touch him. Take the blind... Oh, oh, and then taking the blind man by the hand, Jesus brought him out of the village, and after spitting on his eyes, which is completely nasty, 
Today, today you would have to, you'd have to be quarantined. Terry would tell you that. Sunday would tell you that. Any, any nurse would tell you that. Oh my gosh, someone spit in your eye? They could have AIDS. We've got to do something about that immediately. We got, get the hydrogen peroxide. No, that would be bad. But, uh, but anyways, after spitting on his eyes and laying his hands on him, he asked, do you see anything? <laughs> and he looked up and said, I see men, for I see them as trees walking around. So in other words, he wasn't healed yet. He still saw blurry. This is, hold on, hold on. This is Jesus playing for this guy. Isn't it just only supposed to happen when he touches him once? Isn't that how it's supposed to go? Isn't it? Isn't that, isn't that what? I know, I know I was thinking that when I was in church. If I go up and somebody prays for me, they're supposed to put oil on my head or, or just touch me and I'm supposed to just fall down. And I'm supposed to be healed. And I'm supposed to be delivered. But no, as you saw right here, on the announcements, it took three times. It took Mark, I think, eight to ten. It has nothing to do with them. It just has to do with getting to that point, right? It even took Jesus twice. So then he prayed for him again. And then he was completely healed. That's my point with that, is that even Jesus took more than once. Whoa, that just blew my mind. Jesus took him more than once? Are you crazy? Yeah, man. Jesus took more than once. So don't be afraid to stand in. Stand in and stay. We got all day. We can go all day. But if the Spirit leads you in a different direction, here it is. When we're up here praying, and all of a sudden you hit a wall, it doesn't go from an 8 to a 10 to a 3 or whatever, right? It's okay to walk away. It's all right. It's okay. It's completely okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But seek him. Know that he loves you and you love him. That's the most important thing, is you seek him first. Don't seek the healing. Then you're just seeking a healing. You're doing it just to do it. Seek him first, because then he shows you all things. Right? I'm coming to a close here. I can feel that. But like I said, if we don't go... We don't even start learning that much. We don't even learn that much. So we gotta go, right? So that we can learn. Even, even the great Paul said this in Philippians 3, 13 through 14. Brethren, I do not, do, I do not regard myself as, as having laid hold of it yet. In other words, I don't understand it. I don't get it. I don't get it. I don't understand how healing works. I don't really totally understand how prophecy works and all these other things that Jesus says that we have. I don't get it. So what do I do? I forget what lies behind me and reaching forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. If, and I do this, and you can ask my wife. I think I have to know it all. I got to know everything before, before I step, before I go. I think I do, but I don't anymore. Just like Paul, he doesn't understand it all. He doesn't get it. But he's willing to go forward because there's so much more in Christ, so much more in the upper call of Christ. So we gotta try. We gotta try. No one in here has all the answers. No one. Not a single one. But Jesus has every single answer that we need. Right now, he has every single answer that we need. So here's what I wanna do. Here we go. We're gonna have an altar call. That's what we're gonna do. So I've asked a couple people, I've asked a couple people that I've talked to, and it's only because I know them, and I've talked to them, I spent time with them, and I know their hearts. That's not to say everyone in here cannot come up here and do the same thing. Get that straight. Don't let anything get in the way of that. Please. We're going to do simple prayers. You just tell 
what it is. Remember, come forward like Bartimaeus, humbly expecting, expect him to do something. And guess what? He just might. Wouldn't that be cool? It would be. So you come forward when I tell you, and we're all going to pray for you, and we're going to take as much time as we possibly need. It's going to be simple prayers. In Jesus' name, heal, heal the hips. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. And then test it. If the Holy Spirit, only if the Holy Spirit leads you to pray in a different manner, this is for the prayer people, then feel free. It's his game. It's exactly what he wants. Know that you're the exact person that he wants for this exact moment in time. If, if it's a personal thing, like a guy thing or a girl thing, I just ask girls with girls, guys with guys. I don't want any kind of embarrassment in that situation to get in the way of the Holy Spirit. Because it's all, it's all his game. It's all his thing.